Bonjour et bienvenue sur France. Welcome to France 24 and Radio France International. We are in New York. Our guest for this exclusive interview is the president of the DRC, Felix Chisekedi. With me, Christophe Boisbouvier from RFI. Mr. President, hello. 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 Here in the United Nations, in front of the General Assembly, you made a speech and you directly accused the naked aggression by Rwanda against your country. You also requested the UN to be more transparent about what they know. Why were you sounding the alarm? Are you not heard? This is more about proclaiming the truth than ringing any alarm bells, because the alarm bells have been ringing for a while now in that region. And the alarm has been raised by NGOs and by other actors. Now it was time to say the truth so that the whole world would know what is really going on there. It's time to do away with the hypocrisy, it's time to stop being blind to the problem and to see the whole issue here. And that's what I did. On Wednesday in New York, you agreed to meet your um, counterpart from Rwanda, Paul Kagame, in the presence of the French president, Mr. Macron. You were not keen, but you still went ahead. And the idea that the rebels should withdraw from Bunagama, that was accepted. We still remember that during the previous meeting in Luanda on the 6th of July with Mr. Kagame, there were no results. This time around, do you have a schedule for that withdrawal? Well, first of all, there's something that needs to be said about the French initiative, because as you know, France is currently chairing the UN Security Council, and President Macron had reached out to the two heads of state in question. This was done before the General Assembly so that we could set a meeting here in New York to address this issue. So there were no objections from me on this process. I'm here to say the truth, and this was part of that process, and I said the truth in that meeting that was held with President Macron. The aim was to, first of all, obtain a ceasefire and the removal of the M23 troops, and then to move into a peace process as we decided on in Nairobi. This is a peace process that would lead to the complete end of all violence in the east of my country. When it comes to time frame, there isn't really a set time frame for this, but it will depend on the deployment of regional forces that are coming in. Burundi is already here, Kenya will be deployed soon, and the situation will become clearer to read then. Clearly, another issue that was raised during that meeting is the issue of Rwanda Hutu rebels, the FDLR. Rwanda has been saying for years, be careful, they are a threat to us. And furthermore, the Congolese army is closing their eyes or worse. Do you think uh, this is true or do you think it is a spurious excuse from Rwanda? It is a spurious excuse, but let me address this. I believe that Rwanda is acting in bad faith in this. They're using this as an excuse to justify their military incursions into the DRC. Since I've been leading my country, we, on two occasions, sent back hundreds of FDLR troops. That's proof of our good faith in this. The remaining FDLR forces are just residual and they're no longer a threat. They're no longer a threat for the security in Rwanda. The FDLR troops are actually more a problem for us in Congo than for them in Rwanda. An example of this would be the murder of the Italian ambassador to DRC, uh, 
last January. That was Mr. Luca Atanasio, who was killed by FDLR troops. Nowadays, the FDLR troops are highway bandits and road blockers. They're no longer trying to regain power in Kigali. So that really is a spurious excuse. The truth is something different, and that's what Rwanda should be saying. In order to fight those armed groups that are rife in the eastern part of the country, you accepted the support of the East Africa community and you accepted the deployment of an international force. When will it be fully deployed and how many people do you expect to be there? I already mentioned that the forces are being deployed. Burundi is already here. The Kenyans uh, will be deployed in just a few days, I believe. And they will be coming in through Bunagana for your information. So these forces are being deployed little by little, depending on the means that we have in the field. It's one of the reasons why we came here, so that we could raise awareness with lenders so that they could support this regional force. What if Kenya uh, comes across M23 in Bunagana? Well, you know what's going to happen to the M23. Over the last few months, in the eastern part of Congo, Monasco peacekeepers have been violently confronted by local people. They claim they are not being protected. People died in July. On Sunday, Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General, told us that Monasco was less well armed than the M23. Do you want an early withdrawal of Monasco before 2024? We must look at what role Monisco should play, because Monisco won't be here for very long. And we also need to look at the end of Monisco's operation and try to make sure that the end is on a high note rather than what we're seeing. So no early withdrawal? We don't yet have a set time frame for the end of Monusco. But I do believe that Monusco will have to leave uh, before the final date in 2024. It's probably going to be after the elections in 2023. I think that after those elections, there won't be much more of a reason for them to stay around. They would stay until the end of the elections and then they would leave. I'd be lying to you if I said that this is something that's already been decided. We haven't yet had a real discussion about this issue. But I do think that all parties involved have understood that there will come a time where we're going to need to think about this very seriously. And I think that this is how we're moving. Over six months, you pushed out the two key individuals from your system, your security advisor, François Bayard, and recently, General Simon Yard. Both are suspected of betraying you with the enemy. Did they betray you with Rwanda? François Béat is a different issue. And in fact, his trial is still ongoing, as I'm sure you're aware. He had health issues and he needed to be sent off for treatment. We're not monsters, despite the pressing need for, for, for justice to be done. General Iyar, uh, that's something that happened while I was here in New York, while I was traveling. Uh, my understanding is that some of his colleagues have accused him of contacting them on Rwanda's behalf for them to allow M23 to move through and to take Goma. That's my understanding of the situation. Investigations are ongoing, and I'll know more once I get home. Treason was mentioned. Yes. But François Bayard, that's not Rwanda. Not as far as I know, but as I said, the trial is ongoing. So let's go back to the east of the country. The state of siege was set in May of 2021. If you look 
at the situation. There are no results. Why? What results? Less violence, armed groups being less rife. But there hasn't been violence for 20 years. Do you have some kind of barometer that lets you know when there was more violence or less violence? I'm sure you don't. Could you mention some first achievements? Well, first of all, I think that the mafia groups have been neutralized in large part. I'm sure you would have noticed that income in that region has gone up significantly. That means that the state of siege has at least helped that aspect of things. Resources have become more available. Now, those resources can be made available to dealing with these armed groups and moving them away from what they're doing, because then on top of that, you've got poverty, you've got unemployment. These are the root causes that led them to do what they're doing. In Ethiopia, for example, there are multiple mono-ethnic groups that are fighting amongst themselves for reasons related to their ethnicity, and they have since been able to achieve peace and to stop behaving in that way. So I do think there's light at the end of the tunnel. But that being said, everything's not perfect, and it, it never was going to be perfect, let's be real. We're talking about a region that has gone through two decades of violence and mafia presence. You can't undo all of that, all of these scourges in just a year. And on top of that, on top of all of this, this got interrupted by the M23 that arrived like an uninvited guest and made things even worse. It could be connected, couldn't it? Yes, and I'm sure it is, but we need to get into this and understand everything that's going on. But the willpower is there. How long? How long will you keep the state of siege until the presidential election? Earlier we were talking about elections um, with MONUSCO and when that mission might come to an end. I believe, at least I have no reason to not believe, through my discussions with the Electoral Commission, I've met a number of times with the chairman of the CENI, the Electoral Commission, because I'm making sure that the state supports the process in a financial way, and every time I meet with him, I always ask the same question. It's become a tradition. I always ask him, are we on track to organize elections? And he says there's no problem with that. So I have no reason to doubt in his opinion. He's the expert, and he seems to believe that everything will be fine. My job is to make sure that the finance ministry supports them by giving them the money that they need to push forward. But still, there is that UNDP report published by African intelligence mentioning a likely postponement and there's no election schedule yet. You should be very careful when you listen to this kind of publication because there's a lot of misdirection out there. I've spoken directly to the leaders at the UNDP and they clearly said that they have never said that they are pessimistic about elections being on schedule. This is surely something that our opponents are trying to push. Everyone knows how media can be manipulated these days, and that's what happened here. But there is no schedule yet because there are people in DRC that don't want these elections to happen. If you look at what's happening in the west of the country these days, uh, which is actually quite similar to the kind of violence that we're seeing in the east, it's clear. But there's no schedule. The, the timeline will be set. The timeline is not the problem. We're still more than a year out from the election date. Having a timeline or not having a timeline is not what's going to make sure that the elections happen. We need to get the voters registered and on the list. The time and the date can be set at the very last minute. The opposition claims that you appointed your own people at the top of the Electoral Commission and the Constitutional Court. They say you're trying to lock up the system and you're going to run, aren't you? I think that this is an insult to the intelligence of these two great men, and I'm not the only person with that opinion. If you look at Denis Kadima's background when it comes to elections, 
He was just the best. This was the best person for the job out of all of the people who were candidates for that position, and I'm not the only one who thinks that. And I think that right now we've moved on from that anyway. Even the political opposition has recognized his value in that position, in that job. And all of our partners have also approved the appointment. So there's no longer any reason to doubt the man. As to the president of the Constitutional Council, he was picked by his peers, not by me. This is a false accusation that's being leveled against me, claiming that I appointed him. I didn't know him. He's not an underling of mine. I didn't know him before he was appointed. I got to know him when he was appointed to the Constitutional Court, and before that, I had never had any contact with him, and you can check that. When people look at your record over the last three and a half years, you are criticized by the opposition. That's democracy. The arrest a few weeks ago of your former UDPS colleague and MP, Mr. Kaboud, has raised a lot of doubts. Questions about? He was arrested because he offended the head of state. But maybe he has their doubts. Why should he be in jail? Should he not be under house arrest? That's up to the justice system. I'm not monitoring that case. So you will run in 2023? What about your opponents, VIPs such as Martin Fayulu, who still claims to have won in 2018, Maurice Katumbi, or maybe a pro-Kabila candidate, and even Matata Ponyo? Will you not be threatened by them when they want to push out the incumbent? We need a change. The people will decide. I have no reason to start wildly speculating about what might happen. I'm not the almighty, and I don't have a crystal ball. I go about my daily work. I listen to people, and I try to meet their needs and their demands as best I can. Beyond that, it's up to the people to decide. And they will decide when the time comes who they want to lead their country. You sound confident. You think... I'm very confident. What makes you confident, in spite of those criticisms? I'm confident because of what we've done. We've done huge amounts. If you just look at our budget, if you look at the fact that we've made education free. We're now moving into free health care. We've got infrastructure that's currently being built. And then we have that amazing, ambitious plan for grassroots development, working in developing the 145 territories. We firmly believe at this point that when the time comes, people will recognize everything that's been done and they will once again place their trust in us. So no worries on that. And that's why the opposition is so worried about elections. I have a question about what you said. You mentioned the black hand. What do you have in mind? A potential coup, destabilization by foreign powers? Not yes and no. We're still looking into this. The arrests that you would have seen, the, the arrests that were discussed in the army, they didn't just happen for no reason. There really is a black hand at play here. And that's the reason for the arrest of Francois Bayard? No, no, no. François Bayard, c'est arrivé avant. François Bayard, that, that was separate, that was before. Maybe General Yavoué's arrest is related to that, though. It remains to be seen, though. And we'll see what happens. Thank you, President, for granting us this interview. Thank you. Thank you for watching us on our channels, France 24 and Radio France International.